Good morning, day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in internet land. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by Search Engine Academy. And today's topic is, is Google AdWords right for you? Six questions you need to ask to make a decision. And uh, my colleague out of Colorado, Ross Barefoot, will be presenting. Trying to get the screen to advance here. There we go. And that's me. I'm your moderator, Greg Mate. I'm in the uh, Search Engine Academy, Montreal. We don't say Montreal in Montreal. Everybody else does. So if you want to sound hip, say Montreal instead. Uh, a little bit about the Search Engine Academy. Uh, it's uh, a global alliance of SEO trainers. So we are uh, SEO training company, if you will, with representatives around the world. Uh, we've been in operation since 2002, offering uh, live in-person digital marketing training. So what that means is um, we specialize, we give seminars, but we really specialize in, in workshops. So when you come to one of our courses, uh, two-day, three-day, four-day, or five-day, um, you're going to work on your website uh, in class with the tools we use, using the methods that we use uh, to successfully uh, rank and gain uh, targeted traffic for your website. Uh, another thing that sets us apart is, uh, other than not being really a seminar based, is there's mentoring that uh, is included with the workshop. So afterwards you go back to the office, although you're ready to start going, you may have some questions, you may have some strategy questions or, or things that you uh, notice and not quite sure how to handle, and we're there to help you with that. But. Um, that's not what we're here about. Well, there is a link to a uh, schedule of classes if you're, if you're interested in uh, learning SEO from the beginning or formalizing your training. Um, everyone is muted. You can ask questions. We will be answering your questions at the end of the chat. Uh, so please go ahead and answer your questions. There is, if you go to the handout uh, tab, if you will, and the control panel, you will be able to download uh, the slides from today's presentation. Uh, we are recording this and we should have this without any technical difficulties up within 24 hours for you, uh, in case you have to uh, take off before it ends. Uh, please feel free to share this. A recording with friends and colleagues that uh, might be of, of use. If we run over time, uh, again, you can check the recording to see uh, if there's something you missed. So here's a picture of my colleague, Ross, out of Colorado. He's our presenter today. He's been in business for 35 years. Woo! Uh, he's a programmer, web developer. He started, uh, I guess, in 2001 doing web development. Um, previous to that he was, uh, or I guess during that time he was working with a, a uh, bicycle company, uh, importing company, uh, in the last millennium. So I still have to look up what that means. Uh, in 2011, uh, Ross became a master certified instructor with the academy, finally. He took his first uh, SEO training with us in 2002 and then again in 2004. Uh, so Ross divides his time currently as an SEO strategist at a boutique agency in Las Vegas uh, named uh, Horizon Web Marketing, and he's also on the board of directors with me at uh, Search Engine Academy on the Education Committee with me at Search Engine Academy. And of course, we're both uh, involved in numerous other committees. Uh, you'll be able to see Ross's contact information at the end of the webinar. Ross is also Google AdWords certified professional, which is why he's going to help us out today with, uh, with answers to all our questions. So Ross, how about if I hand it over to you? 
Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that. And, um, uh, you know, to say that my experience is dating from the last millennium just goes hand in hand with that 35 years number that you paused on. So I hate to admit to that, um, but uh, indeed, I have been in small business for a big chunk of my life. Um, and that's important when we're talking about Google AdWords because it's um, something that's very much involves not just learning about search and SEO and stuff like that, but also um, uh, trying to involve it in your business decisions in order to answer this question that you see on the screen, which is, is it right for you? Or more appropriately, perhaps, is it right for your business? Now, whenever I am going through this process with a client, I'll normally ask a bunch of questions, and in order to do this workshop, I picked out six that I think are key to your decision-making process, and I want to go through and, and give you some insight on those. So my goal for today is to help you to understand the dollars and cents that make AdWords work or that make it a waste of time and money for you or for your company, and then to leave you with a clear idea of what you need to do next. It's uh, pretty easy for me to tell you what my goals are, but I think it's also very appropriate to tell you what the, the today uh, we are not going to do. And um, so the first thing is if you came here expecting that this webinar would teach you how to set up an AdWords campaign, unfortunately you might go away disappointed because uh, we're not teaching that today. In fact, my philosophy is why would you need to learn how to do that if you don't even know whether you need AdWords. So that's sort of putting the cart before the horse unless you've already made that decision. And at the end, I'll give you some resources that will help you to learn and set up, uh, to set up and manage AdWords. So uh, it's not like you won't have a path forward on that, but that's just simply not what we're doing today. In order to understand what we're talking about, and I know that this will be basic for some in our audience. We have quite a few people in the audience today, and I'm certain that experience ranges from fairly experienced with search marketing and Google AdWords down to perhaps someone who's never really messed around with the program before, a, a lot of small business people who are trying to learn. And so we will take a moment and define some of our terms. The first term that I'd like you to be very aware of is organic search. And organic search basically just relates to the search results that you get when you conduct a search and Google wants to present you with the best result for your search regardless of whether you paid them any money. And so this is called organic. Think of it more as natural search as well. It's what would come up if Google were simply trying as an impartial third party to take your search term, your, which we call a query, your search query and give you the best result on planet Earth for that particular search. Now there's another type of search and it's called paid search and this is actually what makes Google all their money and allows them to do that other search, the organic stuff. Paid search are the results that you typically will see at the top of probably the majority of searches that you do online anymore. And so you can see an example here on your screen. Google has a disclaimer, and Bing does this as well for their version of the same thing. So it has a little ad next to each of the listings here, and you'll typically see three or four listings. It seems like increasingly it's four. And it um, uh, used to be until recently, you would also see them down the right side of the page, but Google has done away with that. This identifies that the people or the companies that um, are responsible for these listings actually did give Google some compensation in order to appear at the top of the page. And that compensation model is referred to as pay-per-click. Pay-per-click basically means that these four companies that you see up here um, in the search results, as of this moment, they have not paid Google anything to appear on this page, but if you click on one of their ads, that's when then Google's cash register makes a nice little sound that, that pleases the, the board of directors at Google, and the company is charged anywhere from a dollar to fifty dollars, uh, depending on the situation. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, those costs a little bit later in this particular um, in this particular webinar. Now. Pay-per-click is a generic term, and AdWords is Google's specific term for their program. Uh, this is their advertising program, and it also defines their platform for being able to allow 
businesses to manage advertising with Google. Let's define what I consider to be the most important term, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't have this one front and center when they're making this decision. And the most important term, in my opinion, is conversion. And conversion is basically when a webs website visitor takes action, and then they can take action in a number of different ways. They could uh, be looking at your website and make a phone call to you. They could fill out a form and click the submit button. They could make a purchase if you're an e-commerce uh, website. So there are a number of ways that a website visitor takes action. And in each of those instances, what happens is a website visitor becomes something else. They convert in essence, probably not the best term, or they transform, they were a visitor, now they've become a prospect or a customer. And conversion happens all along the business life cycle, and it's the same way with a, a, a merchant who has a storefront location. If someone walks in the door, they're a visitor. If they ask a question, they become an interested visitor, and if they make a purchase, they become a customer. So this is a common theme to all businesses. In the context of our webinar today, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make a decision between AdWords and organic search. And remember I defined the organic search component. It's the natural component. And so, as I say here in the beginning, the internet was something of a chaos. Um, there was uh, there was basically no organization to it, <laughs> and so what happened in order to bring organization to it, um, the, uh, uh, the a, a new type of thing became invented called a search engine, and the search engines that are first arose were basically just trying to help people make sense of the internet, and so the only thing that was out there was organic search, uh, a company such as AltaVista or Yahoo at the time, um, Ask Jeeves, some of these early search engines, they, they tried to make it their mission to help you to find what you need online. Now, as soon as that happened, then along came people who tried to monetize it, and the first one who was successful was a fellow named Bill Gross, and he ran a early search engine that I'm sure Greg and I both remember called GoTo.com. And he created this pay-per-click search model. And GoTo.com uh, became Overature. Overature then later was bought by Yahoo. They were really the pioneers in the field. And then finally, Google got into the act fairly a little bit later in the process, but still early in this cycle of creation. Uh, on the third day, as I say, Google created AdWords. Then on the fourth day and every day after that, Google has been on a path to earning incredible amounts of money. Now about AdWords itself, uh, I defined it earlier as relating to these ads that you see at the top of a search page. And it is indeed that. That's the most uh, common component of AdWords, but it's become about much more than just those text ads that you see. The full extent of the AdWords program is actually multidimensional. And I break it down this way. There's an active component, and that relates to people searching. So if someone's searching for something specifically, they have a real strong interest in it, the ads that appear there are appearing to people who are actively looking for what the ad is about. But there's also a passive component. And when you think of passive marketing or passive advertising, think of the highway billboard. There's a billboard by the side of the road, it's sitting there, you're driving by, you may have no interest at all in what's being advertised. And if you want to look over there, you can, but it doesn't really interrupt what you're doing or, and it doesn't necessarily go along with what you're doing. In Google AdWords, the passive component is third-party websites. And you can have your advertisement appear on websites where people are not conducting a search. They're just, they just happen to be browsing. Now, there's another component that I call the stalker component, and this is fairly recent. And uh, everybody notices, notices uh, this remarketing component. It's also called retargeting. But a lot of people don't know how it works. What they know is they'll be looking at a product one day, and the next day they may be looking at a, a website on the shopping channel or the food network or something like that, 
and an ad for that exact product will appear as they're doing something else and they suddenly have this perception somebody is watching what I'm doing and indeed they are correct and so that is called remarketing then finally Google is trying mightily to monetize YouTube and so there's all sorts of advertising going on around YouTube it sort of exists as its own little uh, its kind of own little independent state within the Google AdWords program so ultimately what that means is a reach that extends to uh, hundreds of millions of people every day and that is of course the value that Google has is that audience I'm just going to go quickly through some screenshots of the types of ads that are covered within a Google AdWords program. You can have product listing ads, uh, and those appear still on the right. You can see in this screen capture with the red box around it. There are local ads that appear next to Google Maps. These are the passive ads I was talking about. So if you look at the lower right of your screen, you can see ads by Google but it's on a website called tasteofhome.com, which is a property that is not owned at all by Google. And the ads might appear as graphical ads in different formats like this, and this relates to the passive advertising. These are ads that appear on something that Google calls their display network, which can also be video ads in a variety of formats. On YouTube, there's a huge range of ads. Some of them uh, are captured by big dollar advertisers, such as in this case Hulu. And then you can have very inexpensive ads appearing on your typical home videos. And finally, probably the latest and, and most aggressive dimension is ads that appear in mobile apps. And these can also be managed through Google AdWords. When it comes to your decision, whether you want to be visible on AdWords or not, I will tell you right away, it tends to be a tough decision. And one of the reasons is because organic search has tremendous advantages. And, and in fact, we as a teaching organization, although we teach paid search, Google AdWords, we also tend to have a very strong focus on organic search because it still tends to be very powerful there's a lot of authority. If your listing appears in organic search results, people in many cases will uh, just expect that it's going to have more authority than an advertisement. There's also something that we call listing persistence. If you are strong in organic search, that's typically not going to disappear overnight. It might erode uh, if you don't pay attention to it. Your visibility might decline with time, but it will take time. With Google advertising, if you stop paying them money, you're, obviously your listings are going to disappear from the internet immediately. Often organic search will give you a broader reach because once your website is shown is, is viewed by Google as being authoritative, you're going to appear for all sorts of search terms you hadn't even anticipated. And, and that can bring you, uh, I love the word serendipitous, that can serendipitously bring you customers that you never had specifically targeted before. So sometimes it ends up carrying a lower overall cost, although the cost of organic search is going up because it requires a lot of work to get it done right. Sometimes it gives you a higher click-through rate, and usually there's a lower cost per conversion. I'd just like to um, kind of go back to that bullet point because I didn't define a term, click-through rate. Um, if your listing appears on a page, whether it's an ad or a listing in organic search results, and let's say 100 people visit that page and five people click on the ad, you have a 5% click-through rate. So try to keep that term in mind because it's a very important one whether you're doing organic SEO or whether you're doing uh, Google AdWords. There's a problem, though, with organic, after I've outlined here all of its uh, amazing strengths. And the main problem is that Google has introduced many obstacles to your ability to succeed with organic search. Most importantly, organic search is a lot less predictable. As far as how Google ranks websites in the search results, they are constantly modifying the rules by which they display certain sites. and so. 
there's a lot of what I would call listings churn in organic search results in this sense. You might be strong this week, and you might have, a let's say, a number three result. Maybe next week you'll be down to number eight. Maybe the week after that you'll be on page two, which means you're effectively almost invisible. And it can go the other way as well. And also, Google has uh, perfected, and, and Bing as well, uh, a concept called personalization of search. And we teach a lot about this in our workshops. Namely, the search results that you see might be different than the search results a neighbor sees or somebody in a different town. So there again, we've got something where there's a lot of um, unpredictability. And in order to manage all this, you typically have to have quite a bit of knowledge and you have to have some skill in implementing an organic SEO program in order to succeed with organic search. And just implementing it does require a sustained effort over a longer period of time. If you learn what you need to do with organic search, you're going to have to work with it for several months before you start seeing results. It's, it's sort of like growing a garden. Um, AdWords is like going to the grocery store and buying your produce. Organic search, and um, whether your garden is organic or not, I don't know, I'm trying to make a pun out of that somehow. Organic search is more related to tilling the soil, planting the seeds, and waiting for the harvest, fighting the bugs off in the meantime, and as any gardener would know, you have to have an ability to be frustrated and work through it with gardening, and you do as well with organic SEO. So the bottom line is this. Often companies are unable to learn what they need to learn, to devote the kind of time they need to devote to succeeding in organic SEO, and then AdWords often becomes necessary to reach your target audience. And often it can be implemented as part of a comprehensive digital marketing program that includes both paid search and organic search. The question here is one that most businesses would answer no. Um, maybe government bureaucracies would answer yes, but do you want to burn some cash? Well, the cost of an AdWords program can add up very quickly. Even a successful AdWords program can be expensive and anything that's expensive needs to be treated with a certain amount of caution. At the same time, although I, I, I say you need to approach AdWords cautiously, the opportunity represented by AdWords is really too good to ignore. So you need to figure it out. And here now we finally get into our questions. The first one is, first determine where are your customers coming from right now. The second is, what is the value of a new customer to you? The third is, is my website, and in this case it's yours, is your website really ready to sell? You also have to ask yourself, well, how am I doing right now in organic search? And then what would be my projected return on investment if I was getting customers with Google advertising? Finally, and this is a really crucial one, even though it's at the end, it's maybe the most important one, do I have time to pay attention? Google Advertising, we'll talk a little bit about this, needs to be managed, and that can be either directly or indirectly. Now, you probably have questions around these questions, so this is just to give you an idea of what I'm going to be covering, but now let's deal with each one of them in turn. So the first question is, find out, ask yourself where your customers are coming from right now. You need to know the source of your business. In my years in small business, and, and um, I mentioned this to Greg, uh, one of the biggest traps, one that almost sunk us as a business was not knowing why we were succeeding. And often, the cousin to that is not knowing who our customer is, where they're coming from, or why they're coming to us. First of all, ask yourself, what kind of a business do you have? How do you sell? Do you sell either transactionally or relationally? Now leads that then convert to customers would indicate a relational business. An example of this would be a real estate agent. Somebody, somebody calls the real estate agent and says, hey, I'm thinking about selling my home. The agent now has a prospect. In order to earn money, they have to cultivate a relationship with that prospect, turn them into a customer, and help them out. Now, customers who just walk in and buy something are more transactional customers. 
And the ultimate example I give of a transactional customer would be a convenience store at the site of a highway going from a big city to another big city. The only people who walk in the door tend to be travelers. They probably will never come back again. They need to fill up their tank and buy a soda and they make a transaction and they're done. So that's a very, very transactional business. Online, we have e-commerce, and e-commerce can often be either transactional or relational, but in most situations, it becomes a mixture of the two. Most companies, even though they want to make a transaction, they also want to create a relationship with a customer that is going to persist and bring that customer back. In order to determine this, and you may already have been done that, have already been doing this, and that is ask and pay attention. And this involves both people and data. So when it comes to people, if your customers either call you on the phone, they come in in person, they communicate with email, you will have to reach out to them and find how they find out how they found you. When it comes to data, some of this you can learn from looking at data that is available to you or could be available to you. If customers convert by submitting a form, for example, online, you can see if that customer arrived at your website after having done a Google search or after having um, found a link to your site from another site or maybe just by typing your website address in. And for that, I recommend using Google Analytics uh, probably most of you either know it well or know it somewhat, but Google's free analytical tracking program is the most, uh, most powerful free tool probably out there online right now. If you were checking on the source of a customer in Google Analytics, um, and we don't cover Google Analytics in this uh, analytics, <laughs> Google Antics we cover, but not Google Analytics in this particular webinar. And I'm going to just show you really quickly, I'm going to switch over to my uh, browser here and give you a, uh, just a taste of what this looks like, just in case you haven't been in there yourself. So if we go into a particular analytics account and going in, it looks something like this. When you go into Google Analytics, you're presented with a dashboard and there's a whole bunch of choices on the left. And, and we teach you all about this stuff in our workshops, so I won't labor this right now. But there's one choice, one menu choice here that is called Acquisition. So I click on Acquisition and I click on Overview. And notice I've got this nice little uh, pie chart that gives me a quick overview and says to me that 55% of my site visitors came from organic search. You can probably see that. And about 25% came by typing in the website address. And then the rest came from referrals, which means they were on another website, saw a link to our website, and they clicked on it. And within Google Analytics, we can dr drill down into each of these numbers and determine, well, how many people came from Google, how many people came from Bing. So there's a lot of powerful data in there that helps get you, helps you to educate yourself as to what your typical customer is like. Armed with this data, we're going to move on to the next question. Let's say we have a good idea where our customers are coming from and what they are like. So now we're going to ask ourselves the question, what is the value of a new customer? And in getting into this, we have to understand this key concept, which is customer lifetime value. The customer lifetime value is a way to get you to think about your customers in the long term. So the lifetime value is the entire profit that you typically would get from a customer over however long they would remain, typically, again, as a customer. And when you're reading marketing stuff, especially online marketing stuff, you might see a bunch of different acronyms, which I put in the footnote here. So just, But the main thing is the concept to keep in mind. In the purest form of a transactional sale, there really is no lifetime value. And you can see this on the chart that I'm putting up uh, here on the next screen. Here's four different examples of how we might calculate customer lifetime value. We've got the pure transaction real, uh, business uh, on the line one, highway convenience store. Notice how I've got a typical profit on a purchase in column one, the average time between purchases in column two for the average customer, and then 
as an average again or as a typical scenario what's the amount of time usually we keep a customer so for that first line we really have no way of measuring columns two or three our customer lifetime value is basically the same as the purchase value and because this is a business that has very low profit margins it's a very low value let's take the next example a specialty clothing store Let's say that um, someone typically will spend about $200, $250 on a purchase in this store. The store does a good job, has nice fashions, good prices. And so they'll see that their customers will usually come in maybe about four times a year. And they can hold on to their customers for three, four, five some years, sometimes longer. So in order to calculate the lifetime value, we just multiply those numbers. $100 in gross profit, the time between purchases would represent four times a year, and then five years. And that we, we see here that the actual value of that customer was not the $100 in profit that we earned the first time they visited our store. It's the anticipation of earning $2,000 off of their business over the long term. Real estate agent has a longer sales cycle, but also a longer return. On a, let's take a, an example of a house that might be a $300,000 house and often agent will get, uh, you know, usually commissions will be split and then split again. So $4,500 here would represent what they would actually earn, not necessarily the, the you know, typical 6% or 5% rate on a purchase. And if an agent does a good job when the person who bought that house decides to upgrade or downgrade, or move to a different part of town, they'll probably come back and use the same agent and do the process again. So we can see here the lifetime value over a longer sales cycle is $9,000. Let's take a little bit different model, and that is a subscriber to a web-based service. If you subscribe to something like, whether it's Netflix or Amazon or, or any one of the other niche providers, you're, you're gonna have a monthly charge on your card, which you're probably gonna lose track of and ignore, and they count on that. And so it's going to take you two or three years to figure out whether or not you really are using the service. And by that time, the, the uh, web-based service has probably earned about $360 on your business in this particular model. So you can see here that it, it really pays to be able to identify what the true value of attracting and acquiring a new customer is for your particular business. And I strongly encourage you to go through this exercise. And if you have to make educated guesses, you're no different than anybody else, go ahead and make those educated guesses. When we get ready to evaluate the cost of AdWords, we need to know how much we can spend and still show a, rep a profitable return on investment for our ads. And that's why this figure is so important. Moving on to question number three. Is my website ready to sell? This is, involves more than just having a website up, uh, a lot more. One of the best things that you can do is go through and do what I call a common sense website review. Page through your site on your own, make sure you're uninterrupted when you're doing this, and ask yourself, is my site easy to navigate? Do I state a unique benefit for my product or service? In other words, are you communicating your message? Do you have a call to action? And a call to action is simply a marketing term for a statement that encourages someone to take action. And you'll also see the acronym for this used quite extensively, a CTA. And it's very important to have a page that doesn't just offer a particular product or service, but tells people what you would like them to do in order to engage with your product or service. Ask yourself then, when you're on your website, is it confusing? And try to put yourself into the mindset of someone who's visiting it as a stranger. Not only determine if it's confusing, but ask yourself legitimately, does it look to be professional and trustworthy? And these things all are deciders when people are, are trying to decide whether they're going to become your customer. Once you've done that, you need to go through the same process on mobile. Nowadays, it's very typical for 50% of your audience or more 
to be looking at your website on a mobile device. So you really have to go through and, and do any of these types of exercises, both on a mobile device as well as on your desktop computer. You can examine your Google Analytics numbers for something we call user engagement. Check your site bounce rate. The site bounce rate can get a little bit complicated and sometimes it can be a little bit deceptive. So what I'm going to say here is just a basic rule of thumb. The rule of thumb is if someone comes to your site, takes one look at it and decides it's not right for them and they immediately hit the back button without doing anything um, that is going to be profitable to you, we would call that a bounce just conceptually, someone who takes one look and leaves. When we can determine what percentage of people take that action to bounce, we would call that a bounce rate. If 100 people visit your homepage and 80 of them decide that they really can't stand your homepage, they can't figure out what your website is about, they're going to hit the back button and go pick a different search result you would have an 80% bounce rate. And again, there's, there's a lot of subtleties to this, but that's the basic idea of it. And that's the type of thing that you can get from Google Analytics. So going back to my Google Analytics screen here, if I go back to um, just, in this case, my audience tab here, the one that I look at when I open up analytics, you'll notice that Google reports a particular kind of bounce rate right down here. So in this case of this site, it's a 64% bounce rate, which is fairly high. I'm not going to go through each of these other metrics. Only know that these are things that you can use to be able to determine whether visitors to your site are actually going to become leads or customers, whether they're going to actually convert. And each of these particular metrics is available just by digging into your Google Analytics account. You also want to perform a conversion test on your website. Countless times I've found um, someone with a website and they have a form, for example, that someone is supposed to fill out and submit. And when someone from the company actually goes to do it, they find that the form is broken or that it requires data that nobody would want to give them. So if you have anything for sale, make some purchases on your own. You can always refund your card. If you want leads, test any forms you use to get people to send you their information. If you're wanting people to pick up the phone and call you, then make sure the phone number is highly visible. Make sure it's accurate, too. Some of these basic things get overlooked at times. Once again, perform the same test on a mobile device. You can also do something called a low-budget user test, and uh, Greg here is a, uh, is a usability um, consultant, and so he normally would do a sophisticated kind of test. You could hire somebody like Greg if you really want it done right, but you can also do something on a low budget, and that is have a friend over to your office. Have them sit down in front of your computer and then tell them, uh, hey, go ahead, here's my credit card, go ahead, uh, pretend you want to buy something. Or if it's you want to capture leads, you can say, hey, um, uh, take a look at my website. If you were interested, how would you contact me? Can you contact me through my site? And then you do the hard part of this, which is sit back and watch and make sure you don't help them to do it. What you will learn is often very enlightening. You'll be able to see, all right, is my website really welcoming or is it confusing? And that gives you then an idea of whether you should be spending money to bring people to your site only to have them confused and go away without taking action, which would be a waste of money. Therefore, if you see that you have work to do, do it before you begin with an AdWords program. And I hope that's fairly clear because there's a real danger in skipping this test. And, and one of those dangers is, if you skip this test and you go ahead and say, you know, I don't have time to fix all this stuff on my website. I just need to see whether AdWords is going to work for me. If you start an AdWords program and it doesn't work, how will you know? It's all you'll know is that it didn't work. You won't know why it didn't work because it may not have worked because your website is lousy. In which case, 
you will have decided AdWords won't work for your company and you will have made a bad decision. Make sure finally that your website can track your conversions. With current website technology, you can tr track just about anything. You can track those form submissions. Obviously, you can track any sales done uh, in an e-commerce relationship. And there are even ways that you can track phone calls. And then you can integrate all of this tracking with Google Analytics. Now, if you can't measure these key numbers, once again, you're not going to be able to know whether you're succeeding and you're not going to be able to know whether you're actually throwing money away. So don't start with working with AdWords until you can actually track these conversions. And if you need to, please see your web developer, talk to another consultant, shoot the lock off your wallet, spend a few hundred dollars, but make sure that you can track those conversions. Question number four. Ask yourself how you're doing already in organic search, the natural search results that come up. To do that, you have to determine what your keywords are. Keyword research can be very involved and very sophisticated, and we'll off, both Greg and myself, we'll, we'll often do pretty expensive keyword research studies for clients, but for the purpose of this, you don't really need that. You need to start by just figuring out intuitively from knowing your own business, what are the words that are likely to bring the right customer to your website? Make up a list of 10 to 20 of these words and do some searching and see if you so show up in the search results. One of the things I'm going to suggest that you do is when you do your searching, use a special Google search tool called verbatim mode. Let me just show you how to access this. If I go to Google, and let's say I do a, a search on real estate agents, Wichita, Kansas, who knows why I thought of Wichita, but if we, if we go with this and we look at the search results here, some of these search, if I've been to any of these websites, if one of them is my website, Google might show it preferentially to me because they think I'm interested in it. The way that you avoid having Google try to make that kind of a guess is to click on search tools and select under all results the choice that says verbatim. Verbatim means that Google will show you what they consider just be generically the best search results regardless of whether or not they think they're right for you personally. So it's generic results versus customized results. And typically when I'm doing uh, some keyword research. I'll often do it both ways and get a feel for whether a particular website is highly visible in its key uh, in the key terms that matter to it. If you do show up and you're not um, and you're able to track conversions, but you show that nobody's converting, you show that people are coming from organic search results, but they're not doing anything. That's another way to evaluate the question we posed in. Um, uh, the question number three, is your website ready to sell? Because if you show up for organic results, people are finding you and they're not buying from you, are you going to make your situation that much better by buying more traffic through Google AdWords? I would probably say no. You need to find out what's going on first that is keeping people from turning into customers. If you do well in organic search and you are getting business through organic search and you start AdWords, then be prepared for cannibalization of your search traffic. And what that means is, is typically you're going to give up some of your organic search traffic and it will go to Google AdWords if you have a strong presence. And this is especially the case if people are searching on your brand name. Here's an example. I did a search on Lexus of San Diego. I have no business relationship with this client. I just wanted to see what would come up. And you'll see uh, if someone is searching for their brand name, Lexus of San Diego, they've got basically really the, the only choices that they have are going to take them to the Lexus of San Diego website. There's a paid search result at the top. And then there's a block of organic search results all pointing at Lexus San Diego. And then on the right, you see a listing that's generated by a Google My Business page, and Google thinks it's the most relevant search results, so they give it a lot of coverage here. Now, let's say that this ad did not appear. 
do you think that anybody would not figure out how to get to Lexus San Diego? Well, I, I would think that's unlikely. It, it would seem to me that anybody who did this search, ad or no ad, they're going to find their way to the dealership they're looking for. On the other hand, if the ad is here, and I type this in, and I'm just a typical searcher, I'm not caring whether or not the merchant is paying if I click on this one versus clicking on this one. So I'm probably going to just drop down to the uh, most convenient place to click. That's going to be the paid listing. Uh, in this case, Lexus of San Diego is going to pay for that click as opposed to their organic search results. I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing. Because in some cases and in some types of searches, your total overall traffic is going to go up, even though you're paying for traffic that before you didn't have to. But be aware that you're going to see this in your data. You're going to see that some of your organic search is going to be cannibalized by your AdWords program. One of the, and when I say you're going to see it in your data, that's if you comply with this suggestion, and that is make sure you track your total conversions. And, and remember I had said you need to have your website able to track conversions. Make sure that that's been tracking conversions for at least 30 days so that you can measure whether the money you make with AdWords was merely cannibalized from your organic search traffic. Again, this is evaluating dollars and cents. One of the things that you need to do is knowing how to segment traffic in Google Analytics in order to see the differences between paid and organic search. I don't have time to go into this, but if anybody needs information on how to segment their traffic and see it split out between paid and organic search in Google Analytics, please just drop a request in the question box and I'll send you some informative links that will help you get started with that. It's not very difficult at all. Question number five, what's the projected ROI getting customers with Google Advertising? Well, for this step, you're going to need a Google AdWords account. And if you have an, basically you can sign up for an AdWords account without spending any money with Google. And once you have the account, then you have access to a tool called Google's Keyword Planner. Once you're in the Keyword Planner, you can plug in the 10 to 20 terms that I recommended that you use in question number four. And so let's go here and take a look at this. This is a Google AdWords account. And the Keyword Planner is found under Tools and then Keyword Planner. Now, once you have your Keyword Planner up, and it's taking a moment here. I normally start with this choice right here, which is search for new keywords using a phrase, website, or category. So let's say I wanted to see the volume on Wichita Real Estate or Wichita, Michita, Wichita Real Estate Agents. And I'm misspelling all over the place here. And then I normally, I've set here the targeting. And with, uh, with this tool, you can set the targeting for any community or for the entire United States or for the entire world, if that's the case. And then I click on Get Ideas. Google will try to give me a whole bunch of ideas, which they represent here, for terms that I might be interested in that are similar to Wichita Real Estate. I'll go to this tab here called Keyword Ideas, and I'll click on it. Because although it may be interesting for me to see all of Google's choices here, for the purpose of this exercise, I really want to know specific data on these terms. And they'll appear at the top when I do the search like this, when I use the Keyword Planner like this. And now I'm going to show you how we're going to make use of this data. So in this case, I've plugged in 10 Wichita Real Estate related terms. And the two columns I want you to pay attention to are average monthly searches and the suggested bid. Average monthly searches is, on a, in a typical month, how many people are going to key that word or phrase into Google search. And in this case, it's how many people in Wichita are going to be searching using that phrase. The suggested bid is if you were to run a, an AdWords program and you wanted your ad to appear, how much is it going to cost 
if one of those people clicks on your ad. And that's going to be the suggested bid over here on the right. And as you can see, it ranges from a high of $2.56 for this group of terms down to a low of, what is it, 61 cents, 56 cents, sorry, missed one there. For a rough estimate, you're going to need to do the following. You need to determine the monthly cost, if, and this is for a hypothetical AdWords program, the monthly cost for whatever volume of search you expect. Determine how many of those searchers will likely click on your ad, and of those people who click on your ad, how many of them are going to take a desired action? In other words, how many of them are going to convert? Of the people who take that action, then what percent will become paying customers? And finally, you're gonna use the numbers that you came up before on your customer lifetime value. We put all these numbers together and we're gonna end up with an idea of whether we can expect a positive or a negative, and here's another acronym for you, return on ad spend. And naturally, a negative return on ad spend is not a good thing, and it might indicate that AdWords is not right for your company. I went through those quickly, but here's an example of how you can set these things up. Um, here's the combined monthly search volume for the phrases that I showed on the previous slide. The average suggested cost per click, which is $1.33. The estimated click-through rate, which is 3%. Total number of clicks. So if 3% of the people who look at a page with my listing, and, and the 3%, that can vary a lot, but I usually find that's a good starting point. A 3% click-through rate in Google AdWords is, is, is okay. You, know, you can get higher, but that's an okay click-through rate. So if 3% of the people who see my ad click on it, that means I'm going to get about 225 clicks and translate clicks to be a visit to my website, 225 clicks over a three-month period, which is going to cost me about $300. Now, let's say I've determined, and I have a reasonable idea, that of people who visit my website, 5% will pick up the phone and call me. And again, this is the value of having been tracking your conversions with Google Analytics, because if you've been tracking them, you're going to know this number. And so if the number is 5%, you plug that into, in this case, I use a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. That means I'm going to get a total number of phone calls, warm leads, of about 11 over this three-month period. Now, this next number is based more on your experience with your business and paying attention. If, if 10 people call you, and you're this Wichita real estate agent, about how many of them typically are going to turn into a client? In this case, I've said, well, typically maybe 10% are going to turn into a client. That means I've acquired one customer from spending $300. Since the customer lifetime value is $9,000, do I have a positive return on my ad spend? Yes. Naturally, I do have a positive return. Even if I were to only count the first transaction that this person made with me, $4,500, I'd still have a dramatically positive return on my ad spend. But don't stop at that point. Let's say you go through this num th these numbers and you say, wow, this looks really good. I'm going to go ahead and get started. These numbers are preliminary. You, you will use them and say, okay, I'm going to get started with AdWords. But then once you set up AdWords and proceed with your campaign, you're going to need to pay attention to the data that comes back to see if it validates these educated guesses that you've been making. So don't be lazy. Once you've made this assessment, if you're not done. This is your beginning step, and now you're going to need to follow up. And I'm in view of the time here, so I'm going to move right along to question number six, which is, do I have time to pay attention? to this Google advertising. And that would be directly or indirectly. What I mean by indirectly is either you pay attention to it or you have someone you can trust that you hire to pay attention to it. AdWords is a beast. I'm in process of developing a two-day AdWords workshop with my colleague Steve Scott, another trainer with the Search Engine Academy. And these are some of the things that we're going to be dealing with within the two-day workshop. As you can see, there's a ton of stuff here to cover. So 
it's not trivial to be able to track what works, what works best in AdWords, and how to make it work at its best. So the honest question for you is, who's going to ride herd on AdWords for you? Are you going to do it personally? Are you going to delegate it to a member of your staff? Or will you decide to hire a vendor or a contractor? The only unacceptable answer here is, oh, not necessarily, uh, you know, I really don't have anybody available, I'm not available, I don't trust a subcontractor, and they cost too much money, so I'm just going to set it and forget it. And I will tell you right now, AdWords is not a set it and forget it proposition. AdWords requires lots of attention, especially at the beginning. Think, for example, of a plane on takeoff. When a plane is taking off from the tarmac, that's when it's using the majority of the fuel it will use on the whole flight. That's when it also requires the most attention from the pilot and the co-pilot. They have to be really monitoring it carefully. Once the plane gets in the air, it requires less fuel, it requires less attention, but really uh, the pilot and co-pilot can't go in the back and take a nap. They still have to be paying attention. It's very similar to this when it comes to a Google AdWords program. If you are interested in learning how to do this yourself, or if you have an employee that you want to delegate this to, please do check out our schedule for our two-day live AdWords workshop because that would be one of the ways you could get a handle on things. Now, as I mentioned before, the only unacceptable answer is, well, nobody is going to do it. And so my question is binary. If you don't have the time and don't have someone working for you who has the time and you don't want to do a contractor, find a different way to promote your business. I would highly recommend that you don't spring directly into AdWords. So those are the six questions, but I've got a bonus question here for you, and it's sort of implied by the entire webinar, which is, okay, what now? Well, first you need to make your decision. Now, the exercise that we've gone through here may have left you with a clear direction, but I'm realistic. I, I know that probably is all it will have done was give you maybe a little bit of a push towards clarity, but AdWords data is pretty pretty ambiguous. And so before you do an actual campaign, you're still likely to be a bit uncertain. But if you think there's promise in it and it might work, I definitely would encourage you to set up a campaign and test it. Just make sure you know how to limit your budget so that you don't spend too much money too fast. And then pay attention to the results and go from there. You need to determine your needs before you set up that ad first AdWords campaign. Do you need to learn more about the nuts and bolts of AdWords? Well, seek out competent training and information. Of course, that's one of the things that we do. There are other sources out there as well. Do you need a professional consultant? Well, then you need to start this process of finding out who it might be, interviewing prospects, use, it, use some of the knowledge you've acquired here and in some of your other self-education in order to determine who might be a good consultant and who might not be. So for example, if a prospective consultant doesn't ask you many questions about things like lifetime customer value, well then keep looking for a different consultant. Make an action plan and think in terms of bullet points. And here's just an example of a typical action plan. I need to determine my lifetime customer value, then I need to do some AdWords keyword research so I know something about volume and cost. I probably should learn some more about AdWords, so I need to investigate what training is possible for me. I also know that I need to get my website going with conversion, track, tra uh, conversion tracking, so I need to do that. And then I will be ready to plan and implement my first test campaign. So make for yourself an action plan and then follow it. I promised you at the beginning I'd give you some resources for going further, and one of the best one of those is Google, and here's a link. If you download the slides, you'll have this link available, and um, you can just start here with, uh, with uh, this, this particular answer to a question on Google Support Forum is a great starting point. The only challenge there is Google has so much information, sometimes it's hard to find what you need. You can also seek out courses on platforms like Udemy and Lynda. 
And I put a caution here because on May 24th, Google has made an announcement, and they're making a big deal about it, that they're rolling out a new interface for Google AdWords. The implication is all those, there's like 2,000 different courses on Udemy and Linda related to digital marketing and SEO. All of them that show screen captures of AdWords are likely to be dated, if not actually obsolete. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, because uh, as Google does, they're going to be changing things. And then you can do a search on Google or Bing for more information for proceeding. But my caveat here is sometimes it's very hard to tell good information from bad. More resources that are available to you. As uh, a teaching organization, we at the Search Engine Academy are going to be presenting more webinars. So on Wednesday, June 1st, uh, we have an additional free webinar. Is your AdWords agency doing a professional job? And then on Wednesday, June 8th, the free webinar is the four most common Google AdWords mistakes. And those, again, are free resources. The Search Engine Academy also is going to be rolling out a two-day AdWords workshop in July. And here's a link where you can go to the first event that's scheduled. And then more are going to be rolled out as other instructors set their schedule. So check regularly for other dates and details. And there's a link to the Search Engine Academy cal uh, calendar. And finally, you can contact me. Here's my uh, email address, my LinkedIn um, page, profile page, and my Twitter handle. And if you want to reach out to any of the other Search Engine Academy instructors, then follow this link to our instructor page and you might find an instructor who's closer to you geographically and you can find, of course, Search Engine Academy training all around the globe. So now it's time for the questions and answers and uh, we're just a little bit over, but Greg, uh, I, I would imagine you've been monitoring things, so uh, why don't you let me know what we might have? Well, I... I have been moderating. I don't know if I've been monitoring, but let's see. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, there are a couple places where you probably should have moderated me more. <laughs> uh, we do have some, some questions, so let's get right to them. Um, if I'm doing AdWords, should I bother with SEO? Well, that is, a, should, yeah, that is a very should, good question. You could question. turn that around and, and answer it both ways. If I'm doing SEO, should I bother with AdWords? Right, exactly. And, and I would say that, um, as is so often the case, it's hard to give a yes or no answer to that. I would say in general terms, for most people nowadays, I tell them that they should have both an organic component and a paid search component in most cases because then they're covered, <clears throat> they have the organic in order to help um, keep down their overall costs for conversion, but they also have an AdWords component so that they have more predictability in search. It does depend to a certain degree on whether you can make AdWords um, pay. The cost for conversion is gonna make sense to you financially. So I would say though, typically, even, even if you're doing well with Google AdWords, and you think you're getting a positive return on investment, I definitely think you should be working on organic SEO for your website as well. One of the reasons is that Google's, you know, their, their rules change all the time, and they are constantly doing things that are driving up the costs of using the AdWords platform. So although you may have a positive return on investment now, if the costs go up next year, will it be a positive ROI the year after that? Well, here's your opportunity to be preparing your website to take some of that load through organic search. Excellent. Um, typically, uh, how much do clicks cost? Well, again, it's a, it's a huge range when it comes to clicks. That is one of the most common questions that I get, and it's very specific to your particular field which is why you really need to go into Google Keyword Planner and start looking at those suggested costs per click. I've seen um, click costs being in the neighborhood of 20 or 30 cents, going all the way up to 50 to $100 for every click. As an example, trial lawyers, typically personal injury lawyers, they typically have very, very high um, costs per click. 
uh, we were looking at the Wichita, Kansas real estate agents, and it was in the dollar to two dollar range. That's fairly ch inexpensive anymore. One caveat uh, or a word of caution that I would put out there, and that is Google's numbers, where they say suggested cost per click, those are very much estimates. And when we look at those numbers and then do an actual AdWords campaign, after a few months where we've managed the campaign well, often we can beat those numbers. However, at the same time, I have seen industries where uh, Google tends to estimate them low. I don't know exactly why that is, but uh, you have to do your own research, and then you have to uh, validate it by actually running some test campaigns and seeing what the real cost per click is that you get. And uh, just to add to that, Ross, thank you. Uh, the reason the, uh, the cost vary is because this is an auction, right? Correct, yes, and and that's one of the things we didn't go into, uh, namely showing how Google sets those costs because it's a little bit more involved, but the, it's basically a bid system. And so you have, uh, it's going to depend on what your competitors are saying they will pay. And so it's just like everybody sitting around in an auction saying, okay, I, I'll give $2 for a click, and the guy in the row across says, hey, I'll pay two twenty-five for a click, and that can drive up the costs. Cool. Uh, uh, our last question is, you showed a 3% click-through rate in your example. What are the things that affect that? And, and that's another good uh, question because the click-through rate is extremely important. If you have a very poor click-through rate, Google will tend to give you, um, will tend to charge you more for clicks. It's part of something they call quality score. So here's the basic uh, rule of thumb, and that is your ad that you set up in AdWords needs to be highly relevant to the search query that someone is using. Uh, a very obvious example, if I type in Wichita real estate and I see an ad for, let's say, Montgomery, Alabama real estate, I'm not going to click on that ad because it's totally irrelevant to what I searched for. Often people will be very general with their ads. So they'll just, if, if I see an ad that just says real estate and it's not specifically Wichita real estate agent, I was searching for Wichita real estate agent, I want to click on something that matches that. If it just says real estate or even just real estate agent, there I might click on it, but probably not. And that's going to lower the click-through rate. Now the one other component that I talk about is within that listing, whether it's a paid listing or an organic search listing, is your ad needs to give them a compelling reason to click. So for example, if you had um, real estate, uh, you know, Wichita real estate agent, see how much your home is worth for free, that might give a person a compelling reason to click on the ad, as opposed to just saying, hey, I'm here, click on it, you know, I'll talk to you if you beg me to. If you give the sense that you're just sort of making yourself available rather than actually asking for them to do something, you're going to have a lower click-through rate. And all of these things are things that you can test with AdWords, and this is where attention is needed because if uh, for a professionally managed AdWords program, we're constantly trying different things to improve that click-through rate. Awesome. Well, Ross, uh, I want to thank you for uh, for your fine work here. I learned uh, learned something not only what uh, Millennium is, um, and I'm, I want to thank everybody else for attending. Uh, thank you for your questions, uh, and we hope to see you all um, or speak at you all at one of our upcoming coming webinars. Ross, anything to say before we head out? No, thank you very much, uh, Greg, for helping me out with this. Uh, it's been a pleasure as always, and I um, hope to see some of the attendees back on a future webinar. Right on. Thanks, Ross. All right. Take Bye, care. everybody.